And we are live and we are back. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we have, we're still waiting for people to come in. Oh my goodness. People come on in, please. Ooh. Okay. Yes. The truth about Christopher Columbus. Yes, I see people are coming in. Welcome, welcome, welcome to another Tuesday talk. Come on in, good people. Tonight is going to be fire. Tonight is going to be amazing because we have him, Netter, in Tepi, Jabari, Osaze Jenkins. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Jabari Osaze. <laughs> High priest of the shrine of Ma'at as our special guest. Now, it was easy for me to book Jabari because Jabari is the high priest of the shrine of Ma'at. I am a priestess in training under Anika and Jabari Osaze. You so are was, not a priestess in training. You are a priestess. I knew he was going to say that. I am a priestess who has training every week for like 18 <laughs> years. So I threw the in training in there because sometimes we get together and get grilled. But anywho. <laughs> so yes, it was easy for me to get Jabari because I'm like, yo, Jabari, I need you on Tuesday talk. We're going to talk about Christopher Columbus. He was like, bet, right? And his Queens accent because he's from Queens. <laughs> but just because I have easy access to Jabari, and he's on the show like this, it doesn't mean that we are not gonna get the fire. You've heard Jabari speak. You know how amazing he is, how smart he is, and all of the information that he's been studying since he was in high school, since he was like 14, 15. It's crazy, the information that this man knows. And honestly and truly, I can't think of someone who knows more about Christopher Columbus or about this topic than Jabari. Who discovered America? Mm. It wasn't Christopher Columbus. That's for sure. That's who we know didn't discover America. Okay. One reason is because he never landed foot on the on American soil. That's how you know for a fact that he did not discover it because he never even got here. So everybody here who's in America, the United States or the Americas, or if you um, have ever flown into New York City, you've discovered more of America than Christopher Columbus did. And that's really fact number two, because African people migrated around this whole planet for anybody else. Okay. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're just going to talk about Christopher Columbus. So, so without further ado, I would like to introduce to you one of my favorite people, the mm -hmm. high priest of the Shroud of Ma'at, Jabari Osaze. Yay! I'm so honored to be here with you. Uh, and we're talking about such a wonderful topic. Um, I'm, it, it, I'm really excited about what Tuesday Talk is doing. And, and um, I, I have to really give you as much praise and honor for continuing to um, convene Tuesday Talk. Because I think that we, uh, the Shrine of Ma'at, really was looking for um, a, a general forum to talk about important issues, right? More than just issues that might be um, uh, discussed in a comedic ascension, for example, in our regular um, gatherings. And so it's really important for us to be able to have these conversations um, and talk about issues that affect all of our people. Right, right. And so I'm really honored that, um, that you've asked me to come. And you know that whenever you ask me to come, I will appear. That's My schedule true. can be a little hinky sometimes, but definitely whenever you ask me to come, I will appear. Now, let me say to you, family, that we're going to talk about an important topic today. You know that today, Tuesday, is the day after the federal holiday, which for a very long period of time was simply Columbus Day. Simply Columbus Day right? That was the day. Now there are many other um, attempts at trying to create a bit of corrective history so that this year, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, has actually also said 
that this is going to be considered, this federal holiday is going to be considered Indigenous Peoples Day and Columbus Day. Before we talk about Columbus, before we talk about who he was, what he did, whether he should be honored, whether we should revere his name or revile his name, I want us to take a step back and think about where we are. Can I say something? One of my favorite actors, one of my favorite Tom Who actors a few years ago was an actor in the incredible movie, K-Pax. And I really enjoyed that he had a masterful role in The Usual Suspects, where he played the character that surprised everyone in the film, a character known as Kaiser Soze. If you have not seen Kaiser Soze in The Usual Suspects, you ought to. It is clearly one of the best films of the last 50 years. Clearly, one of the best films of the last 50 years. He was also in a movie with Morgan Freeman and Brad Pitt, Seven. Excellent films. Well, most recently, this actor was in another film. The film was called All the Money in the World all the money in the world. And in fact, at the same time that this actor was filming this film, he was also in another series on Netflix that was highly revered. Who knows what the name of that series was? I want to uh, see if anyone hearing the sound of my voice is familiar with who I'm speaking of and what series I'm speaking of. Did you think I was going to just sit here and talk to a boots a shot? I want you all to talk back to me. This is a conversation. And you'll even notice that Jabari, I don't know, uh, sometimes people say, where do you get the time? But I'm a TV buff. I'm a movie buff. I love looking at pop culture and taking in things. So this actor, I'm talking, there we go, Sen Garrick. Kevin Spacey, who was in the in the series House of Cards, which was critically acclaimed. Why is Jabari talking about Kevin Spacey when we should be talking about Christopher Columbus? Well, Kevin Spacey, who was an award-winning actor in an award-winning series on Netflix, actually was killed off the series. And in fact, the movie that he was in I think it was called All the Money in the World. They reshot another actor in his role and re edited so he was no longer in the movie. Why? Why did they do this to this actor that was critically acclaimed at the top of his game? Because it became clear that Kevin Spacey was actually taking some of his youngest male co-host, particularly when he was, I think he was in Newsies or in one of the other Broadway plays that he had actually starred in. And he would get these young boys drunk and attempt to have sex with them. He was molesting children. <clears throat> and because he did that, they, re they have virtually removed this brilliant actor from almost all of his films, all of his portrayals. I'm going to tell you, he is actually, regardless of what you think about him, I think that what he did was absolutely reprehensible. They removed him from those things. They no longer speak the name of Kevin Spacey regularly. So that in some ways they say, this person did something reprehensible. This person did something immoral. We should no longer be recognizing him. Well, let me talk about what happened in New York City yesterday. New York City has one of the largest parades for Columbus Day. And the mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, who is considered um, a progressive mayor, marched in the parade, partially, well, mostly because he was is actually Italian. And he said, 
trying to be progressive and thread a, and thread a progressive needle. He says, I recognize that we should acknowledge the Native Americans who were here and talk about the things that happened to them. But I also think it's possible for us to recognize and admire Christopher Columbus. So they will remove Kevin Spacey from a film for molesting children, yet they will not remove a Tom Who, quote unquote, explorer, who is should be culpable for the deaths of three million people. A man who has been proven to involve himself in enslavement, in the trafficking of minors, sexual trafficking of minors. I'm going to read you some quotes, quotes later. I'm not just giving you these things off the top of my head. These are things that scholars have researched. Yet there are many that believe that what we should be doing is balancing Christopher Columbus and his amazing discovery with the plight of the native people. I'm going to tell you family, that if you believe that that is possible, then you have found yourself embroiled in the largest bucket of isfet, of sin that you could imagine. The reality that is that if they're going to remove people that have done some things, and you know that I'm not just talking about Kevin Spacey, there are many people whose names have been removed. It's hard to find The Cosby Show on TV. The Cosby Show was one of my favorite shows. But because of the things that Bill Cosby said he did, let's be clear, some of the things that occurred, he said he did. It shouldn't have been used against him. They broke the rules. That's a whole other story. They broke rules. They made an agreement with Bill Cosby that if he went before um, a panel and he would actually allow them to question him, that they would not use that material against him in court. Another DA came in and used it against him in court. So it's not that they're allegations. Bill Cosby did admit to some of the things that he did, but they never should have been used because that was their agreement. And I argue that if other people did that, they would not have tried to do that to them. But Bill Cosby was a victim of the skin that he's in. That doesn't exculpate him from the things that he did. But it does explain why the criminal justice system attempted to do something against him that was absolutely crazy. I see... Leon Temple is saying they still have Woody Allen movies playing. Yes, he's still revered. I want you to recognize the hypocrisy of the society we live in. I want you to understand, family, that in the United States today, there are over 6,000 monuments to Christopher Columbus that still exist. 6,000. Let me show you some images because I sit in New York City and I'm not one of those New Yorkers that assumes that everyone sees what I see. <laughs> you know how there's some folks that believe that New York City is the center of the world? What are you looking at here? This monument is often known as um, the, it's, it's a, the, the pedestal to Christopher Columbus at a place called Columbus Circle. There is an entire circle dedicated to Columbus in New York City. In fact, it's not a little janky circle at the end of the street where you, there's no nothing and no one um, inhabiting it. It is a massive traffic circle at the end, at the lower west end of Central Park, a world-renowned location. It is the kind of circle that when you drive around it, you really do feel the magnificence that the planners placed in the design of this circle. By the way, the circle was put in place in, uh, in the 1890s. It's been around for a long time, but I want you to think about the position, the placement of Brian, this. Brian, you're breaking up a little bit. Really? Um. I'm not sure what else to do. Can you hear me clearly? Now, can you hear me clearly? Any better? I'm hoping that you can hear me better. Let me. Why don't you let me know in the chat? 
can you hear me clearly? Why don't you let me know and we'll continue here. I want you to recognize that as you see this magnificent circle, you are actually that you are actually look at here's an aerial view of the circle. Can you see how grand it is? Look at how amazing this is. Jabari, you have to share it. It's not being shared. Oh, it's not shared? Oh my goodness, what happened? I thought I was sharing the other part. Okay, here we go. You shared the other part. I put you on solo so people can just see you. Oh, so maybe it popped it out. That's good. Okay, so take a look at that. This is the grand oh. circle. By the way, if you come down here on a nice summer or, or spring or fall evening, it is bustling. It's like, this is New York City. And then you look at the center of this circle and you see a genocide there, a pedophile, an enslaver, the man whose name should be synonymous with white supremacy. And I want to be very clear. There are those people, I know that these are not the people I'm speaking to, but there are those people who say, if we remove the monuments, we're removing our history. Ironically, one of the people that says that loud, so loudly, actually owns this building. He lives, well, I don't think he lives in it permanently anymore. But can you see this black building here with the globe in front of it? Anyone know what that building is? I don't even know what that building is. That building is Trump oh, Tower. Yeah, 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 I know what it is. Or lived until New Yorkers said that they didn't want him here, so then he ended up moving to Mar-a-Lago permanently in Florida. I guarantee you he still owns the space and comes back and forth. We just don't hear about it. But uh, Donald Trump actually used to continually say that if we remove monuments, we're actually removing our history. And I want to be very clear. Monuments are not made to simply tell the story of history. A monument celebrates a particular part of history. That's right. At the base of this structure, Abutsa Shot, you will find this. This statue is supposed to be an angel holding a globe. They're not simply saying, well, guess what? Christopher Columbus actually journeyed here, and many Europeans did not know how to journey to the, to the quote-unquote new world. But let's keep in mind that they are saying what he did is an act that is smile that is smiled upon by God. That's what they would say. Why else wouldn't they put this at the bottom of this magnificent monument in New York City? So let's break this down a little bit. Let's talk about who the man actually was, what he actually did. And I believe that these cities, by the way, the other thing that I think is very interesting is that most of the cities that have these large monuments are cities that have very large populations of people of African descent, Latino people, people of color. And I guarantee you, we weren't the ones that put those there. Sometimes you'll hear people say that these monuments were placed here because they were recognizing the, the celebration of an Italian American. I want us to demystify some of this. Abu Tzashat said part of this earlier. Christopher Columbus never set foot on North America. Did you hear what Period. I said? Period. Christopher Columbus never set foot on North America. These monuments, the thousands of them that still exist in the United States and in other parts of the world, particularly let's talk about the United States, these monuments were placed in the 20th century. One of the earliest ones was the one that I just showed you, which was placed at the end of the 19th century in, in the 1890s. And in fact, there was no day which commemorated um, Christopher Columbus until 1932. So you're selling me, telling me he did all of these important things, but there was no day commemorating him? This is recent history. 
And I want us to recognize, just as we see all of these monuments to the Confederacy, this is a power move of Europeans, of the Tom Who, to celebrate something that they don't like to say publicly, but we know is in their heart often, white supremacy. White supremacy. Let me read a quote from um, one of the people who puts together one of the largest Columbus Day parades um, in Baltimore, I believe. And he is the head of the Order Sons of Italy and America. I know, Order Sons. It's a little awkward, but that's what they're called. Osea. This is what he said. He says, Columbus Day recognizes the achievements of a great Renaissance explorer who founded the first permanent European settlement in the New World. Lies. Just, just, just not true already. <laughs> All right. Period. The arrival of Columbus in 1492 marks the beginning of recorded history in America. I can't with these people. Let's the, the beginning of recorded history in America. Yes. That's like saying. That's like saying like nothing that world. anyone did before he got here was a yeah. Exactly. No, that you got it, Jabari. Because go ahead. <laughs> Now, if you're already upset with the two sentences, wait till you hear the third. Let me just say this. Before you drop the third, it is it is almost like they got together and they were like, dude, hold my beer. How can we make the most ridiculous, obnoxious lie that makes absolutely no sense and none of it happened? None and of get it these folks to print it. And, and then we'll get people to believe it. Yeah. Dude, let's do it. It's yeah. like, it's, it is absurd when you, if you do a T chart of truth and not truth, there's nothing in the truth column. Uh, you have, you haven't even heard the third sentence. Listen to the third sentence. Columbus day celebrates the beginning of cultural exchange between America and Europe. Isn't this a euphemism for the statement of native people? How do you create such an awkward, barbaric, immoral, is fetian? Can you repeat that? I'm not sure if the if the reception went out or if it was me. Can you drop num the third? Drop that check. This is what it, this is the third sentence. It says Columbus Day celebrates the beginning of cultural exchange between America and Europe. Maybe by cultural exchange, he's talking about the female native um, children who he trafficked to the um, to Europe so that they could use them as sexual slaves. Is that what he means by cultural exchange? <laughs> Let's continue. After Columbus, millions of European immigrants who brought their art, music, science, medicine, philosophy, and religious principles to America. These contributions have helped shape the United States and include Greek democracy, Roman law, Judeo-Christian mm. ethics, and the tenets that all men are created equal. This is the quote of the head of the Order Sons of Italy in America. Now, I want you to recognize that if you listen to this and you turn off your rational thinking, if you put down your feather of ma'at, this actually might sound logical. It certainly has lots of nice words in it, but all you have to know is a little bit of the history of Christopher Columbus, and you begin to recognize that they are celebrating someone who actually needs to continue to be reviled for the things that he did. And if they're going to remove Kevin Spacey from a movie and then say that we should be able to recognize the, the Native Americans and Christopher Columbus, you have to recognize that they have slathered every single word that comes from their forked mouths with nothing more than lies. And this is something that we need to make sense of. So let's begin. Let's talk a little bit about who Christopher Columbus actually was. First of all, there is some disagreement today. Well, there's some discussion as to whether Christopher Columbus was either Spanish or Italian. But most scholars believe today that he was born in Genoa, which would later become modern day Italy. And he was born around 1451. So most historians would argue 
that he was actually um, a European and an Italian. And you should know that he actually made travels as a young man working on ships and that he traveled to Greece, he traveled to Ireland, he traveled to England, and he even traveled to Africa. Did you know that Columbus had been to Africa before he made his journey to what he thought was Asia, but actually was the Caribbean? Did you know that? That he was a familiar with the African? I'm sure and he was. Fact, in his journeys to the United, to the United States, to the New World, to the Caribbean, there were Africans aboard those ships. Did you know that? Does anyone know who the four prominent men who seem to have traveled with Columbus who are of African descent were? But what are they known as? I wanna know how many of you are doing your research on the day. Does anyone know what they were known as? Put it in the chat. Let's see what you know. And so after returning after these voyages, he returns and he actually asks several of the European um, seats of power to support his journey to what he believed was Asia. He thought that he could navigate to Asia. And he asked for support, financial support, in order to make this journey. He went to um, Portugal. He went to England and he went to Genoa and Venice. Genoa and Venice are now parts of what we would consider Italy today. And it's believed that none of those other crowns decided that they would support him. So then he goes to Spain. Sorry, where did he go first? Genoa, where else? He went to Portugal. He went to England and he also meant he also went to um, to uh, the, the areas that are known as Italy today, Genoa and Venice. And I know some of you are saying, hey, he had Morris traveling with him. I don't, I want you to be specific about who the people were who were with him. Come on now, we know a bit more about who they were. Does anyone know what their names were? I'm gonna drop that on you today because I want you to know this story better than anyone else. So that as we try to understand these stories, we are able to truly understand how our analysis must be guided by the truth and by history. I see, is that diff one star? Send diff one star said Pedro Alonso. Bing, bing, bing. He got one of the names. Good job, brother. You should know. And I see um, Sinet Mila uh, Bivin says um, they were sailors who navigated him. Yes, there were four individuals. Generally, they're known, sometimes known as El Negros, but they're usually known as the Nino brothers. The Nino brothers. Did you know that there were Africans that were that traveled with Columbus? Let's go further. They didn't just travel with him. It is believed that these brothers actually captained two of the ships. On the first voyage, Pedro Alonso was likely the pilot of the Santa Maria. And his brother was the master, the person in charge of La Nina, and he owned that ship. And it's also believed that um, uh, Francisco, who was another of the brothers, so the brothers are Pedro, Alonso, Francisco, um, uh, Pedro, Alonso, Francisco, and Juan. And Pedro's son was also on board, and he seems to be traveling along with his, his uncle. So, so Alonzo is the fourth one. So Pedro, Alonzo, Francisco, and Juan. Pedro Alonzo is one name. He's known okay. as Pedro Alonzo. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have Pedro Alonzo, Francisco, and Juan. And Pedro's son, Bartholome, was also there. So there were four men who are known now as African, as Afro-Spaniards. Their father 
believe it or not, was from Ghana. Uh. Her father was from the Elmina area of Ghana. So understand that they actually had grown up in Spain, perhaps been born in Spain, but everyone knows because they were known as El, uh, Los Negros, Negros, they actually, even in the historical record, Africans assisted him on this journey. Which means they did it. They probably, they did it. <laughs> well, it means this is one of the reasons. They were known to be extremely talented sailors. They were known to be extremely talented sailors. And so I want you to understand how this occurs. Oh, so let's continue. So as we actually, um, let me just say this really quickly. Uh, John Tay Lee says, I'd like to know if there's some coincidence or any correlation with the Moors being expelled in 1492 and Columbus's voyage the same year. Seems pretty quick. Yes, there are correlations. These things were going on in Spain you know that the Moors actually had major a major foothold in Spain for like 700 years. The, the center area of the Moorish empire in Spain was in Cordova. And so the, 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 the Tom who actually were flushing them out, pushing them out, and actually in some ways doing it in a very violent fashion at the same time that Columbus asked for assistance. It is possible that Spain was looking for new routes to enrich themselves as they were kicking out some of the most wealthy members of their society, those people who were in control of Spain for 700 years. So this is likely why Isabella and Ferdinand decided that they would invest in the voyage of Columbus. These things are not disconnected. And Columbus would have been very aware of what occurred with the Moors in Spain during that same period of time. So they were biologically brothers. Yes, the four, three of them were brothers. The fourth one was the son of Pedro Alonso. So three brothers and a nephew, a son and nephew. So let's continue. These are the Nino brothers. If you want to do more research, look for the Nino brothers and you will be able to find more on this story. So they finally make their journey and Columbus believed that they were going to Asia. Where is the first place where Columbus lands? Where is the first place that Columbus lands? Some people, if you listen to propaganda, you might actually think that Columbus landed in New York, that Columbus Stop. landed in Washington, D.C., that Columbus landed in San Francisco. Look at all of these places that have these incredible monuments to Columbus. Well, I want you to understand that the first place that he goes, by the way, he never comes to what is considered the United States today. He never sets foot on North America at all. The first place he goes to is the Bahamas. That's the first place he ends up. He then also journeys to Cuba. By the way, you should know that he did not know that he was in Cuba. He did not know that he was in Cuba. Where did he believe he was when he landed in Cuba? Does anyone know? Now, you know that as I ask these questions, you also just pop it in the chat. Where did he think he was when he got to Cuba? He thought that when he got to Cuba, he was in China. He thought he was in China. And then when he actually goes to, um, to the island that we know as Hispaniola, which is where the Dominican Republic and Haiti reside now, he thought he was in Japan. And I want you to know, I'm not saying he got there and said, oh, this is Japan, and then said, wait a minute, this is not Japan. I must be someplace else. He never understood that he was in the wrong place. He never understood that he was not in Asia. Let's continue. So when he gets to this place, there is so much propaganda around what happened when he got there. And I want us to look, I, I, can you look for a moment? Let me show this um, again. This is from the monument in Baltimore. 
look at this image. On one side, you see Genoa, Italy, birthplace of Columbus. Then in the middle, you see him meeting with the Indians. And then on the other side, landing in America. With that flag. I mean, you look at this, you actually might think, well, he was a nice guy who was just traveling the world. Well, why don't we actually listen to what he says about his um, his first trip to the Bahamas? What does he say about the people that he finds there? I want you to actually listen to his quote because he actually decides that he's going to describe, he's going to pen a letter and describe the people that he meets. This is how he describes them. He says, they should be good servants and intelligent. For I, observe, for I observed that they quickly took in what was said to them, and I believe they would easily be made Christians. As it appeared to me that they had no religion, I, our Lord, being pleased, will take hence at the time of my departure six natives for your highness, that they may learn to speak. I might be able to give a full account to your highness, and also where a fortress might be established though I do not see it would be necessary. Okay, you're trying to conquer these people. Why don't you think a fortress would be necessary? Listen, listen more carefully about what he says. For these people are very simple as regards the use of arms. If you should order them all be brought to Castile or be kept as, as captives on the same island with 50 men, they can be subjugated and made to do whatever is required of them. These ideas that Christopher Columbus was an explorer, <laughs> that Christopher Columbus sought to actually engage in cultural exchange, that Christopher Columbus wanted to navigate the globe for this idea of some sort of scholarly inquiry are all completely false. And they're false, not based on our ideas, false based on his own words. His plan, his plan was to subjugate. His plan was to murder. His plan was to make people who actually greeted him, gave him provisions, and assisted him in his journey. His plan was to make them enslaved. That was his plan from the beginning. And when we think about these things, how in the world could we possibly think that it should be okay for us to simply understand that the natives really struggled and that Columbus also made some accomplishments? If you are going to erase Kevin Spacey, you should literally obliterate the name of Christopher Columbus. This is the hypocrisy that this country engages in. This is the hypocrisy. And there are many people with power who have done inappropriate things. And we're seeing that some of them are actually facing a reckoning right now. Where is the reckoning for Christopher Columbus? Because a few of his monuments are taken down and Joe Biden decides that he's going to bifurcate the holiday, is that okay? Would it be okay for us to celebrate the birthday of Adolf Hitler along with Passover? <laughs> Is that balance? Well, this man was responsible for the annihilation of nearly 3 million people. Let's continue. Let's continue. And so with all of the things that he did, I want you to understand that... Um, Columbus decided that he would take several people with him. On his first journey, he captures 25 people and takes them with him. But I, it only seems that seven people make it. What happens to the balance of these people? What happens to the 18 people that did not get there? We have no record of them. In fact, we have no record of what happens to the seven later. 
But with all of this, he receives a title, the Admir Admiral of the Ocean Sea. Now, Columbus's plan was to return again. And one of the reasons he tells us that he wants to return to this area again, in his diary, he says that the natives told him that before he had ever come there, there were black men with spears that were tipped in gold and that they had voyaged there first. Now, remember, Columbus was well aware of the African. He had at least four Africans that journeyed with him. And he had actually already journeyed to Africa. So when he heard this, he was startled. And in his journal, he says he wanted to return so that he could see those Africans, see if he could find them. I want you to recognize that one of the reasons that some individuals, scholars above my weight class say that Africans journey to the Americas comes out of the mouth of Christopher Columbus. Please let's obliterate his name ourselves. It, it comes out of his mouth. That's where it comes from. That's how we heard it. So on his second journey, which leaves in 1493, he actually travels with 17 ships, many, many more, and 1,500 colonists. His plan is to have people stay there at this point. And it is when he gets there that we actually see precisely what had been planned. One of the, um, uh, the settlements that he creates is called La Isabella. And this is, of course, for Queen Isabella, Isabella, who was one of his major patrons. So he names this place for her. And it is on the northern coast of what today would be considered Dominican Republic. So I want you to recognize that um, they're already beginning to put a Tom Hu European stamp on the land that they think will be um, there uh, permanently. I, uh, we also see that there's another um, site known as Campeche. And um, it, it's very interesting that when we look at some of the folks that were there, when we look at the radio, when we look at the carbon isotopes in their teeth, it seems clear that some of the people that travel with him were not just Europeans, but there were, there may have well have been some Africans that travel with him as well. Very interesting. Part of the story that is not told. It's part of the story that is not told. And um, let's fast forward a little bit. I also want you to recognize that it is this point that he decides that his major work, some of the, the, the thing that he is going to make the most money from is the sexual transit of young, um, I shouldn't even say young, of, of, of um, female children, native female children. Listen to the words of one of his childhood friends, Michelle Dequeno, Michelle is, a, is like Michael, it's a man. Let's call him Michael so you're clear. Michael Dequeno actually writes in his diary what Columbus does for him because they are great friends. This is what he says. While I was in the boat, I captured a very beautiful Carib woman whom the said Lord Admiral, the Lord Admiral is Columbus, gave to me. When I had taken her to my cabin, she was naked, as was their custom. I filled with a desire to take my pleasure with her and attempted to satisfy my desire. She was unwilling and so treated me with her nails that I wished I had never begun. What is he saying? She fought him because she did not want to be raped. Which woman would? He's taken her captive and he's attempting to rape her. But to cut a long story short, I then took a piece of rope and whipped her soundly as she let forth such an incredible scream that you would not have believed your ears. Eventually we came to such terms, I assure you, that you would have thought she had been brought up in a school for whores. 
I hope you feel the pain of those words. Mm. I hope you recognize that there is no reclaiming the name of Christopher Columbus. I hope you recognize that we should be practicing excrement ceremonies for him. I hope that you recognize that there is no way for you to balance the accomplishments of Christopher Columbus with the pain, agony, and annihilation of the Native American. That in fact, even if you want to recognize that many Europeans could not have made the journey, why is that something that we should celebrate? There were people already living there. This space was not discovered. How do I roll up in your bedroom and say, hey, I, I discovered this. And in fact, his quest was not for discovery. His quest was not for um, the, the sake of knowledge and information and cultural exchange. He was looking to enslave, to pillage, to murder, to rape, and to traffic women. That is what he was doing. Let's speak plainly. There is no celebration for Christopher Columbus. When I was a much younger man, perhaps a bit more radical, I remember going down to the Columbus parade in New York City with a sign that said, Columbus was a pedophile. And I held it above my head. And I was with my boys so that if anybody wanted to play, they could have done that. They could have gotten that heat. That was before I was a priest. You want to catch that heat? We, could, we got it for you. But I think we need to say those kinds of things. We need to be plain about what the legacy of Columbus was. And as people of African descent, let us recognize Christopher Columbus did not enslave Africans. I'm coming to why if you only want to look for the African in this story and for how our lot fared after Columbus's actions, I'm coming to it. Jabari. Yes. Before you go there, I want, can you, what happened when you, when you went down to, to the Columbus Day Parade before people were even, <laughs> and you had the sign that said, I told you, I told you he'd been in the game for a minute, right? One lady um, tried to spit at me. Ooh, what did you do? I said, you're too far away for that spit to reach me. Why don't you come a little closer? Okay. What'd she, you do? Was, she was not that foolish. Right. She was not that foolish. I so, you know, would. yeah, yeah. I see Jehutimus in the chat. Jehutimus at that time. This is before I was a priest. I was in the comedic tradition. Baba would not have been happy me arguing with ladies at the parade. But still, you had better know that. This is oh, I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> Jehutimus knew me then. This was this was like after college when, when I knew him as a much younger um, man. And so I, I want you to recognize that we need to push the envelope. I don't understand why Italian people, some of them believe that they are moral and decent people, could wrap their pride up in this person. Jabari, I have I have said the same thing. If as a as a proud African woman displaced in the Americas, as a black American on both sides, all four grandparents, I am absolutely proud of all of that, including the fact that I recently found out that the original African woman who was stolen by these savages, who came here, who was a part of my ancestry, is a Hausa woman. Mm. Like, you ain't tell me that. I didn't tell you that. You ain't tell me that. I'm Hausa. Hold on. Hold my on. bad. My bad. <laughs> my point is, if you want to take an African, a Hausa, a Black American, who has raped, pillaged, stolen, committed genocide, and didn't wash his ask me no more questions, I'm not mm. going to claim that person. I'm not going to claim, I'm not going to wrap my entire identity around that person who was clearly against anything natural. Everything that he did was against life and vitality and sense and order. Mm -hmm. And I have no way, you know what, I'm going to ask an Italian who who promotes Christopher Columbus or who's proud of Christopher Columbus? How how is it that you choose to how is it that you 
knowing now what he's done, choose to associate yourself with that person. I don't associate myself with R. Kelly. And don't mm. put in the chat, oh, but he can sing. We're not talking about the singing. We are not no. talking about the singing. Don't put in the chat because I'm going to call you out. Okay? So when you think about, that's a real life example. You think about his age and then look at your child, your daughter, or a picture of you when you were 13 or 14 or 15 years old. And then look at a grown man and then holla back. Okay? I'm not wrapping myself around his talent because the man can sing because I certainly listened to his music before I knew what he was doing. Okay. But once you realize who somebody is, it's, I feel disgusted when you hear it and when you someplace and you hear it, it's like, Oh, I need to take a shower that needs to go. or I need to go. So it's the same thing. And I'm, and I, and I'm trying to think of the Italians. I know I'm going to ask him if I can, I'm going to just do a little yeah. list. And, and let's be clear. Um, R Kelly, um, actually created incredible music let's be clear about it yes. and made millions of dollars for it when we think about christopher columbus think about what he actually did the depth of his isfet the depths of his crimes we can't even mention the name r kelly with regard to the things that christopher columbus did exactly Yet, celebrate him there's still a federal holiday with his name yep. and they're about to put r kelly r kelly is in jail He's not coming out of jail, not anytime soon, if ever at all. If ever. So no. how can you think that the same people could speak ill of this man, yet celebrate, yet celebrate Christopher Columbus? I want to say one more thing, and I'm going to give you back the mic. Celebrating Christopher Columbus and having a holiday in his name and, 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 and the pushback on taking him down, like when Bill de Blasio try to straddle the fence. I want you to think of a fence, the old school fences, and 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 don't put the piece on top. So let the spokes stick up in your head and mm. just take Bill DeBazio and on with his right leg, he has to think about his constituents. He has to think about his own Italian-ness, his own whiteness, and then let him take his tall, long leg over the side into his family with his dark skinned black wife and his black kids that look like me because she's so black, she's dark enough to make a child with a white man it looks like me and he's sitting there straddling the fence of a straight up lie of filth and disgust and the people the brown and black people he has to look at at night i hope he sees this video and if 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 the tamahu and this country and britain and all those colonizing european countries ever told the truth and took down monuments of enslavers and and pedophiles and rapists and people who didn't wash the crack of their tails, they wouldn't have anybody. That's why they can't do it. You can't take away Confederate leaders. Quite frankly, you can't even take away some union leaders because if you take away people based on ethics, morals, and principles, the principles of Ma'at, who's left? Who's left? Some Quakers, some friends, people with the, the what's the organization they've started? The Quakers, they had a school, the friends. They, had, they were the friends. The, the friends. friends. Yeah, Who, we got it. Who's left? Yeah. I, I, I really want us to recognize that we have to be absolutely clear about the legacy of Christopher Columbus. And until we actually deal with his legacy, we're going to continue to see those sorts of behaviors bubble up into the modern world. The hypocrisy of the Western world is what we're speaking to. And for the person who celebrated Columbus in a parade to say that along with Western values were the idea that all one men were making were um, are, are equal, how can you say that when you're celebrating a pedophile? So let's go further. I want you to hear Columbus's own words about the girls that he was uh, that he was selling. This is a quote from his log. This is from 1500, eight years after his first journey. He says, a hundred Castellanos are as easily obtained for a woman as for a farm. And it is very general that there are plenty of dealers who go about looking for girls. Those from nine to 10 are now mm -mm. in demand. Mm -mm. Those are his words. Yesterday was a celebration for a pedophile. 
Yesterday was a celebration for a sexual trafficker. And we have to speak truth to power. Let's go further. That's so disgusting. So that after Columbus begins to set up these permanent establishments in, in the um, Caribbean, you should know that they began to do the most barbaric thing to the enslaved native people. They forced them to work in gold mines. And if a man would come back with less, a, a smaller amount of gold dust that was expected, guess what he would do to them? They would chop off his hands and have the man wear them around his neck as a warning to the rest of the native people. It is believed that they would actually use attack dogs on natives so they could try to see which dogs were most violent. Mm -hmm. That Columbus's men had a sport where they would try to see who had the sharpest sword and the strongest swing so they could try to cut someone in half with one swing. You said the sharpest sword and what? The sharpest sword and the strongest swing. It was a competition to see if you could literally eviscerate people. It was known that when they fell short of meat provisions, that they would go and eat, eat native babies. And that it was not unusual for them to wait for a native woman to be close enough to giving birth that the baby would be able to be torn from her stomach alive, mm -mm. and they would hang the woman with their umbilical cord. Mm -mm. Mm. And the baby to the dogs. Now, I know that some of you might possibly be listening to this with your children. I should have given you a disclaimer before I went into some of the details. I'm not going to go, I'm not going to say much more about the, the actual barbarism, but I will say to you that um, one of the people that traveled with Columbus, a man named Father Bartolome, well, his name was Bartolome de las Casas. He was so reviled by what happened that he reports on what happens and that eventually a, a Spanish official by the name is Francisco de Bobadilla, Francisco de Bobadilla actually is assigned as governor of Hispaniola. And there's so many complaints, by the way, the complaints, some of the complaints are from some of the colonists who say that um, uh, Columbus has created a, an extremely stratified society where some of them receive almost nothing and those people who are closest to him receive everything. And that some of them were actually beaten and treated poorly. That was one of the major complaints. The complaints about his treatment of the natives were in the second tier of complaints because you know, not getting enough food is the same as eating babies. Anyway. That's the right, Ronald. Governor Francisco de Bobadilla actually removes him from his post and takes him back to Spain to stand for his crimes. He and at least one of his sons are actually imprisoned. And you might say, well, oh, this means that Spain actually recognized that they had actually had in their employ a pedophile, a rapist, and a genocide dare. But no, the Spanish crown removes him from jail, gives him plenty of loot, and returns his, his title so that he can travel once more. And so Columbus continues his journeys. He even continues to his fourth journey to the area. And during that entire time, Bartolomé de las Casas, who was so reviled by the things that are, that are done, decides that he is going to become a friar that he's gonna become a priest. He's not going to, to be one of the regular folks there anymore. And he begins to write stories of the brutality by which the Spaniards treat the native people. It is believed that when Columbus got to the island of Hispaniola in 1492, there were approximately 3 million people living there. In 20 years, there were less than 60,000. Father Bartolomé de las Casas says that in one day, they had a sport, a game where they annihilated 3,000 people in one day. In one day. Wow. 50 years after his journey, it is believed that there were no, none of the native people of Hispaniola were left, that they annihilated all, all 
three million people. Oh wait, three million, not twenty million. Three million, no, tw in twenty years. Oh, they they, they um, annihilated nearly um, two point five million people. So sorry, guys, I'm. I've and in fifty years, in fifty years, um, it is believed that none of them were left. And I'll say to you that with this barbarism, Father Bartolomas de las Casas makes the argument that the native people should not be enslaved and that the treatment of the native people was inhumane. But in his initial writings, he says, instead of enslaving the Native American, they should enslave the African because the African has no soul. Now, I want you to know that he does re, he does, um, uh, uh, actually argue later that he was wrong. But part of his early argument against the enslavement of the native actually led to the enslavement of the African. And that it is believed that one of the first people to traffic in enslaved Africans is not Columbus, but his son, Francisco Columbus. And so I want us to recognize that when we celebrate Christopher Columbus, when we recognize Christopher Columbus, when we allow these monuments to exist, when we allow celebrations to occur, when we allow kids to say little quaint poems about Christopher Columbus, what we are doing is we are celebrating the worst possible behavior that a human being could possibly engage in. That we are celebrating rape, we are celebrating pedophilia, we are celebrating enslavement, we are celebrating the entire annihilation of a people, genocide. And that this must be, if we are actually the keepers of the scales of Ma'at, that we should speak up. Because it is through Columbus's work, it is through Columbus's evil journeys that the entire process of white supremacy, of world white supremacy and domination has its beginning. I'm truly hoping that all of you are familiar with this story and can tell it, perhaps without some of the, the gory details, to your children. No, to, oh, to your children? Yes. Okay. Because I think that when you hear all of the details, it is impossible for one to sanitize it. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I thought you were going to say Santa too, um, without the gory details to adults. Go adults getting it. Give it to them. Every, everyone, I think, needs to know exactly what happened under his, his uh, the barbaric journeys. And I think that some of the details that are in this are things that you should know. We should know that he made four journeys. We should know, yes, that there were Africans with him. And those Africans probably helped him on those journeys. By the way, he shouldn't even get credit for the ability to navigate. That's really what I'm saying when I mention that. And we should know that his plan was to subjugate people. We should know that it is clear that he said that the best people to take to enslave were little girls because those were the ones that were most sought after by the men in Spain. And we should recognize that through the things that he did, over 3 million people were murdered. And even in one day, 3,000 of them were murdered in what Bar Father Bartolos de las Casas calls sport. So it wasn't even a battle. They were actually having, a, it was a game. Fun. They were having fun. It was a game. That's what occurred. That's what occurred. How can we allow images like this one to continue to grace cities where black people are the majority. Columbus meeting with the Indians as if he had a conversation with them. Right. <laughs> How can we allow those to exist? We have to make sure that the true story is known and that worldwide supremacy is crushed because those ancestors of the native people and the ancestors of the African are expecting us to reclaim them, are expecting us to understand what happened to them, are expecting us to undo those things that were done. I'm truly hoping that tonight in our conversation, you've learned information 
and that you will share this story as we move forward. So before we finish, Dennis Allen has a good a good question. Yes. Um, books lie, uh, the book Lies My Teacher Told Me. Um, did you talk about the clergy that was with him? Can you speak on the clergy that were with him? Well, let me say that uh, for the, uh, um, that Columbus always has a lot of um, uh, support from many, many people who were in, who were part of the church. And you should know that the church plays an even larger role after this, right? Of course, you know that it's the papal bulls that allow um, these European nations to be able to carve up Africa and to carve up other areas, right? I will say that there were also some people of the cloth who, had, who were reviled by what he did. But for the most part, he saw nothing more than support. And that is that is real. That is real. That is absolutely true. And, and not course, surprising. It's, believe, it's, it's interesting that I have thousands of books in this room and mine is not in here. But if Bam! You, there you go. Do you, you didn't think I was going to have you on here and not bring up seven little white lies? He, if you he want to know lies. more about this story, much of this is in Seven Little White Lies. It's in chapter six. Much of this story and many more of the details, the names, the story are in this book because one of the lies is that Columbus discovered America. Can I jump in and say something real quick? Go when ahead. We, when we are having priesthood training, Jabari could be talking about anything and the book that he has is right here. He turns around and looks and then he's like, bam, here's the book. It doesn't matter what question we ask, whatever. He has the book, it's right there. Jabari has a problem. He knew we were gonna have, we talk about Christopher Columbus, he talked for five straight hours and he don't have his book. But you know what, bam, I have- I it. don't have my book, right? It's amazing. You don't have your book. So <laughs> I have his book, I read his book, he autographed it for me. And yeah. let me tell you something that's really good about, those, about this book. It's, um, Someone from eight to eighty-eight can read it. Yeah, it, it's it's very easy reading. It's just like listening to him talk. It's very he explains it well, and it's it's easy to absorb the information. It's easy to study it. It's easy to know it. And yeah. and there are, are also other. There are six other little white lies. I'm gonna just. I know this might be a little off topic, but I'm gonna read them. Caucasian number one. Caucasians are the original people. Chapter two, ancient Africa contributed nothing to civilization. These are some bold face lies. Mm. Um, the ancient Egyptians were Caucasian. Hebrew slaves built the pyramids. Africans were savages when the Europeans enslaved them. Columbus discovered America. Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. A blue, oh, that was the last one. <laughs> and then there's a blueprint for the rehabilitation of the black image. It's really a good book to get guys. I, I was asked to write that book um, because it was the vision of an elder who was now an ancestor known as Dr. Dr. Edward Robinson. And the African Genesis Institute asked me to actually put that, to create that book. And the African Genesis Institute is a youth group. So uh, my, my intent was to try to write a book that was digestible um, by, for, by all ages. And so that's really, really? what I'm to do. Oh, well, yeah. you you did that. I didn't even know that that was one of the charges to make it digestible for a time. Yeah. I didn't yeah. even know that, y'all. It, it became part of the curriculum for the African Genesis Institute. Yeah. And we had children as young as seven reading it. So our goal was to try to make, make it accessible. Now, for seven-year-olds, it's a little much. It's a little hard. But certainly by the time you're in sort of middle school and upward, you should be able to master these topics. And Absolutely. the chapters is supposed to be self-contained. They reference each other, but you could just go to a chapter and read that chapter um, and, and get a lot of information. The chapter that I'm drawing this from is chapter six, as you can hear Abutsa Shot mentioning. And um, I really do believe that while we know that these are lies, most people who have just a little bit of knowledge understand that these are lies. The reality is that we have not com um, com completely contended with them. And because we have not completely contended with them, there are other ways that it has flown into our society, into our culture, into our thinking. We have to tear the, the lies out by their root in order for us 
to truly have a rehabilitated, a corrected image of the African. That's period. So that is what we must do. Christopher Columbus is almost the, the founding father of white supremacy. And we have to find ways to contend with the celebrations of him, the memorials of him, the memory of him. As we talk about Christopher Columbus, we can certainly talk about all those other things that have happened to people of, of, um, of color, people of African descent, the native people and others. And so it's of critical importance for us to do this. And Jabari, Dwight, that's Sen Sean that says, that's genius writing. I appreciate you for saying that, dear brother. It was not easy, trust me, it was not easy, but definitely um, I, I tried to make a book that was palatable and you'd be able to access it. Um, somebody asked, for, um, Kerman Wingfield asked, what link do you use to order it? Do you have the link? Where, the best, what, now, let me say this. You can easily order it on Amazon, but you should also consider ordering it on jabariosaze.com. Because if you order on, on jabariosaze.com, I might get myself in trouble by saying this, by the way. If you order on jabariosaze.com, it will come signed. It will come signed. Oh, Anika going to get you. Yeah, that means a lot more work for me. But I truly hope that you um, look to do that so that you are able to benefit from it. I, I, it was a lot of work. It was a labor of love. And I think that there's a lot of information that is important for our people in it. I'm, I'm trying to get the link. All the questions, all the thoughts. I put it there. Did it hyperlink? I don't know if it hyperlinked. Well, it's jabariosaze.com, y'all. Y'all, yep. you can I have don't know if it Yep. Listen, you got they can, they can easily um, also uh, um, cut and paste it. Yeah. Okay, good. There you go. Yeah. And you if you it to be signed, there are lots of ways you can get it signed. If you got the book on Amazon and send it to me, I'll sign it and send it back. I would do that. Of course, you'd have to pay postage. But then, of course, if you come to any of the events that, that we have, I will always sign your book. I would love to do that. Because I want to know, one of the reasons why I signed the book in person, because I want to know what you think about it. I'm hoping that you're reading it, and I hope that it spurs on a different conversation. As we attempt to reclaim the names of our ancestors, we can only do that by understanding the history that we are living through. So guys, our, our for sure. Um, so Leon Temple said, when do we have our next service? Do you mean like church th that we call Ascension? Um, that is... Not this coming Sunday, but the Sunday after. 24th. Yeah, so 10... 24 is Ascension, mm -hmm. and we have it every, every other Sunday. Other week, every other Sunday at 12 noon, we have Comedic Ascension. Oops. Yes, every other Sunday is Comedic Ascension. And the next time that we have a public event is the Winter Solstice, um, which will be at the Tekken in Central Park. So if you are nearby, um, you, can, you can come by. And this is where... I put I put the date and the time um, the day and the date in the chat. So if you guys want to get your book signed, um, come through. And John Tay Lee saying, "Will Jabari ever come to Florida? I would love to come to Florida. I would love to have an organization invite me. Um, and of course, you know that this the stuff that I do is not what supports um, my my life. I do it because of labor of love." If you have a budget, even a small budget, to assist me in getting there, I would love to come. So just invite me, and we'll work out the details. So uh, you should know. Oh, and I should say this for folks that are asking where I'm going to be. Um, uh, October 23rd, Jabari is going to be doing a tour of the Carlos Museum in Atlanta, and um, you're, we're going to um, do. A, I'm going to be on a panel for the documentary Hopi. Um, and so all of those are things I'm going to be doing in Atlanta. I'll be in Atlanta that weekend. That's in two weeks. And then the weekend after that, I'm going to be in Philadelphia. And that is for the Penn Museum tour and another panel with the for Hopi. And so we're going to be doing quite a bit. 
we're going to be doing quite a bit. Um, October 30th, October 30th yeah. for Penn, October 30th for the Penn Museum yeah. Tour. October 30th is the Penn Museum Tour and panel. Both of them have panels in the evening. So the tour is at 2.30, the panels are at 6.30. And so they should be a lot of fun. I see someone asking, are there shrines in Delaware? I'm not aware of a shrine in Delaware, but to be very honest with you, the Shrine of Ma'at does most of what we do online. We have many members that are all over the United States and even members in other parts of the world. So if you are interested in what the Shrine of Ma'at does, you should go ahead and join. We're gonna be doing initiation. We're gonna be having our initiatory practices. Um, they're gonna occur early next year. Our applications will be um, available public in about a month. So you should go ahead and look for that. The applications will be available in December. Yeah. We make our announcements on Cometic Ascension and we will let you know there where to get your applications there. So be ready, okay? Right. Be ready. Be ready. So we're going to do that. And certainly Delaware is close enough that uh, we could have a relationship there. If there were folks, you should know that the Shrine of Ma'at is branching out. Our first iteration of the Shrine of Ma'at outside of New York is likely going to be in Phoenix. I saw Sen William Humphrey, also known as Tuhuti Forever, on this at one point. He has been named the Jati of Phoenix which means that we are going to be establishing a location in Phoenix. We are yep. not beyond the concept that we should go ahead and have other locations in other places. If there were enough people in lots of other places, we would be there. So if you want us to come to Delaware, first of all, you should be part of the Shrine of Ma'at. And if there are enough people there, we would create a, a shrine there as well. That's something that we're, we're considering. So let me let me add some clarity to when Jabari says create a sh create a shrine. Right now, at in two thousand one, and in the near future, what that means is having another Jati or someone who is the one who does the administrative work in that area. At this time, that does not mean buying a building and hooking it up and having like a preacher give a service. We are not there. Okay. Our 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 goal is to be able to extend the reach of the Shrine of Ot and to ensure that Kemetic spirituality is a mainstay throughout the nation and throughout the world. That's right. We're going to need people who assist us with that. Um, if you're really interested, speak to us and we'll work through some of the details with you. I see Sen William is still there. Look at that. He he just made a comment on Facebook. Sen William is the Jati of, of um Phoenix, and we're excited to be able to work with him to pull that forward. Right, right, yes. We definitely uh, will address- the Equivalent of prime minister, you should know. So he has a he has a title, a new title in that area. And there will be other Jatiyu, other Jati people in, in other places. He is Jati number one. And so you should know that that is um, something that we're doing. I also see in a comment here, are there other people um, tuning in from Chicago. Chicago might be number two. We're talking about Chicago right now, Lou Ra. Um, you should also know that um, folks are asking, are there some books that you should get on our history? One of the challenges I have are trying to get people a list, a, a short list of books, because Jabari Osaze has thousands of books, and I absolutely enjoy, love studying our history. There are many, many, many texts that I would suggest that you read. Um, it it kind of depends on what the what topic you're looking for. Um, you could certainly read everything from um, uh, the uh, they came before Columbus. Certainly, um, uh, Brother Tony Browder's book Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization is amazing. Um, you should always also look for. If you're thinking about African-American history, oh, I should also say my African-American history course starts on October 28th. If you go to jabariosaze.com, you'll see that. I'm teaching a full course on African-American history, and we're going to use Dr. Malana Karenga's book and Dr. Um, John Hope Franklin's book, From Slavery to Freedom, as the primary text. You're going to read both of those, and you will learn the history of the African-American. We really do believe that it is important for you to truly understand how we got to where we are. Because if you understand how we got to where we are, 
you can understand what you must do today in order to powerfully go into tomorrow. That is why history is so important. And I'm truly hoping that you will help us in our study and you will help us along this journey. Any other questions, comments? I have to say this. We, there, there are a lot of books. There's, I put in the chat, When We Ruled by Dr. Robin Walker. I'm reading that book Excellent right book. now. Excellent um, book. That gives a history, like a, an overall history. Like, and, and, and that to me, see, that, that gives you like a, a structure so that when you learn other pieces of information, you know, kind of which column to put it in, like where in this um, genealogy of our lives, yeah. you get this information. There's also African um, philosophy by Theophilo Banga. Mm -hmm. One of the um, members of the shrine recommended that book to me. That book um, is dense. It's a dense book. So is, so is When We Ruled. It's one of those books that you have to, you must have it in your library. What does that mean? You have to, even if you get a 10th of what you're reading, you have to continue to do the study because there will be a point where you will be able to understand 100%. And it means that this is the kind of work that you must do in order to truly understand our history. So please, it is an essential book. It's a relatively new book too. Um, Dr. Thea Falabenga has been around since Sekanta Diop. He is one of the OG historians, right? But his recent book, African philosophy is critically important. So please get a copy of it. Um, uh, um, also the book, um, uh, Spirituality Over Religion is an excellent book. That's a recent book by um, our dear brother, um, uh, Kaba Kameni. I was thinking of the name I knew him was an- uh, spirituality, uh, spirituality Before Religion. Spirituality Before Religion. Where no, is it? No, that's not it. I know which book you're talking about. I just had, oh my God, I just had him on the show. I have it on my shelf right above me. Is it Spirituality Before Religion? Yes. Yes. I might have the title slightly off, but if yeah. you search that, you'll find it. Hold on, I want to get it right. It's Spirituality Over Religion by um, Kaba Kameni. I oh. had him on the show. Yeah. Um, Last year, I remember um, before religion. By uh, hold on, guys, Kaba. This is live. Try the religion and hit search. You'll find it. Spirituality before religion. Before. Um, I, I had him on Tuesday talk last year, yeah. and we discussed this book. Yeah, it was excellent. It's an excellent. Yeah. Book. And Kaba Khomeini has a um, a website. Kaba Khomeini Khomeini, and um, I think it's Kaba. Kabakameni.com, but if you Google it and get his website, Kaba is another really good teacher who um, can explain oh, it. Yeah. And, yeah, he can explain it and it makes sense and he answers your questions. He's a very clear, good teacher. I mean, if you, I've heard Kaba speak, I've had him on the show. Jab I've heard Jabari speak, I've had him on the show. Um, I, I, um, Anthony Browder, he, he, I've heard him speak and he's been on the show. All of our all of our scholars are first of all legendary, and we are living in a time where we have these people accessible to us, either in person or online. A lot of it through their own websites or through the shrine. So take advantage of of reading their books and going to their lectures and financially supporting them, including Jabari, because we about to put all the cash app joint right here right now, um, because. Just like um, Sen Vernon, who was one of the priests of the shrine, we don't do it for money, but we need money to do it. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the, yes, um, Cortia, thank you. Kaba Khomeini just recently wrote the Shabaka Stone. Yeah. So it's important to read these books. My suggestion, because I asked this to myself, I needed some background. They came before Columbus gives us that more, that more ancient type of starter space. And then you have when we ruled. Um, or African philosophy to give you your structure. When we ruled by Robin Walker and 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 African philosophy by Theophile Banga are thick books. They can be intimidating, but it's worth it, I think. So, I mean, there are so many books, but I would start by um, having a backdrop. That's just how I feel personally, because it, it just might make sense to have like a structure to it, and then you'll know where in history and our history, 
when you get new information, where to place it. And I'm going to say to you, one of the great things that you can do is take a course. And right. the front of the, well, the Center for the Restoration of Odd, which is my educational arm, um, really hopefully is one of those places that you'll be able to study it with a scholar and understand the information. So we have a course on African-American history. We have a course on comedic history. We have a course on the comedic language. And we're also going to be bringing forward our course on the history of Nubia soon as well. So there's a lot of information for you to, um, to receive. And I really hope that you are um, able to be part of it because this will allow us to be powerful once more. So. Also, we need some powerful donations. Jabari, what's the cash app for the shrine? Uh, it's it's um, uh, dollar sign shrine of Ma'at. It's that simple. Dollar sign shrine of Ma'at. Jabari um, uses the money to shine his head. Then uh, Leon Temple says, Comedic 101. Are you talking about Comedics 101? Comedics 101 was actually Baba Heru's um, uh, introduction, initiation into the Shrine of Ptah. It's no longer taught in that format anymore. The, the Shrine of Ma'at has created um, a, a, something that's similar to it that we call initiation. It's called Introduction to the Comedic Mystery System. Um, and so, or KMS. And so I'm hoping that um, for those of you who want to learn more about the comedic tradition and also want to understand um, uh, some of the history and, of course, more importantly, the practice, will, you'll, you'll be engaged in that. And as we were saying, our initiatory um, practices will start in February or March of next year, but the applications will be a, a available just in, in December. So please go forward, be prepared, okay? Take this journey with us. Take this journey with us. It's fun and it's a lot of work, but it's worth it because because what you what you are craving as an African spirit, you will begin to get the sustenance that you're craving. And you'll it's like being brought into like you see this little pinhole of light and then boom, the doors open. And for me, it was overwhelming. And sometimes it's still a little bit overwhelming to get all of the information and meet all of these people, but it's it's worth it. So mm -hmm. applications come out in December and initiation, just like Jabari said, begins late February, early March. Yep. And you will find it on, you will get your inf the information at Ascension every other week and our next ascent every other Sunday, our next Ascension is the 24th. And again, if you want to see Jabari and get your copy of Seven Little White Lies signed, um, our winter solstice, the winter solstice is, I have it here, it is Tuesday, December 21st, we will be at the tech in. And I also see that someone is saying, um, will you make an appearance on the Killer Priest podcast with Tehuti? Um, I, I, as when I'm invited, I try to come forward. So just, just send me an invite. Send me an invite to um, Jed D J E D Jed at shrineofmaat.org, and I would love to be able to be present and talk to our people about important issues. So, absolutely, reach out to me. I'll definitely come. So. Last season, so this, okay. So last year we did Tuesday talk. It was recorded. It was smooth. This year we're live. <laughs> and um, and my internet connection, I live in the woods right now. So it, this is, it, listen, this right here is the best seat in the house. Okay. So I find it. I finally figured it out. Blah, blah, blah. I figured out what happened when I had Kava on and I also had um, Infudishi. I got booted out myself. I was like, how do I get booted? It's my party. It's like getting locked out your own house, but there's a party going on and you're trying to get in. But anyway, Infudishi and Kaba, they're teachers. They don't need me. So they, you know, they rocked with it and I got back in. I figured out that problem. So that problem is gone. So live is dope. Do it. Don't apologize. You're doing something powerful. I'm just saying. I like to do it. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. You're doing something take, powerful. We'll it. figure it out. Thank you. Trust me. Listen. <laughs> When Jabari Osaze started doing online classes in 2008, my first few classes just didn't work at all. 
It was, it was painful. It was painful. I had to give everybody yeah. their money back. It was painful. And so um, you are experiencing the Shrine of Ma'at as it becomes an international institution. And what's happening now is you're seeing individuals who have gotten in at the beginning and are going to be part of this movement going forward. So some of the folks that you're seeing, you're seeing Abut Sashat, who was one of the leaders of the Shrine of Ma'at, you know, they'll speak about her in the annals of history later. <laughs> but doing important work, and I think that you're going to to recognize this later, all of you. So you know, I see some familiar faces on here. Um, I see some of y'all who who are in my Monday meditation. And I never said peace to Brother Ronald Boone. How was your queen? Um, he's a brother I've known for a long time, and and okay. Anika and I actually conducted his wedding. I see people that I know on here. <laughs> sure, 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 sure. So when you when you, join, when you become a member, we're that family and the sense of family that, and, and I knew Jabari and Anika um, about eight years before I initiated. I'm not an OG in their life like um, Jahuti Mess, who um, they knew each other way back in the day. And, but I just, so even having known them, the feeling of family that I felt after I became a member is something that I really just had no idea about. I mean, it, it was just, it is, it is just something that I have always wanted, mm. you know, because I, I didn't feel like that at the church because I didn't believe anything that was in the Bible, except that Jesus was Christ, but I didn't believe anything else. And if you don't believe anything else, and they're talking about Moses with the Ten Commandments, and then my little eight-year-old head, I'm like, that never happened. So you just feel, you know, like this isn't just space. This is your space, you know. And and it and it just gets better if you do initiation. I'm not trying to push it because if you ain't ready, then you ain't ready. If you still need to do more work to find out if this is the home for you, then please do that by all means. But what I'm saying is, is y'all sat through 30, almost 40 minutes of us trying to figure out how to get on. It's 10, 18, and we still have 76 people. Yeah. So that's saying that that you you know like this family, and and we need people who want to learn and who want to be a part of. Of this movement it's a lot of work but it's a lot of fun you know it's not a, it's not even gonna feel like work thank you Cortia. i see a lots of folks that we regularly see i would say ankh and ma'at i think that's the net b that's um comedic spectrum nbn comedic spectrum ankh and ma'at to, to um i believe that's the net b there i also see um brother daniel laroche my my dear brother we just got back from Kemet together um, I hope all is well with you. I'm looking forward to see you again. I see Sunet Michelle Mendez, better known as Sunet Newt, um, who is a full sheet of the Shrine of Ma'at. Um, so many people here, I just have to say um, that we mur you, we love you, and hopefully we will continue to work together. Thank so you, you, guys. Thank you, Queen of G's, Lavanda Sweeney. Thank you. Thank you for all the thank yous. It's really appreciated. So awesome. We'll see you guys next Tuesday and then next Sunday and eventually at the tech in and all that good stuff. Peace, love, and hair grease. Much more to the family. Love you all. Shema Ma'at. We'll see you soon.